Today's scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel according to Matthew. It's in chapter 15, and it is a story of a woman who does interrupt Jesus, a foreign woman at that. In a custom of Jesus' day, a, a Jewish man would not speak to a woman in public he didn't know, and let alone a person from, a, from the surrounding area around the, the the Jewish people, the Judea. She was Canaanite, which means she was local to the the area outside of Judea. Here are these words. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And just then a Canaanite woman came from that region, came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented with a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she is shouting after us. And he said, I am only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed immediately. This story has always interested me primarily because Jesus is bested. It's bested by not his disciples, not by someone he knows, but by a complete stranger in which he follows the precepts of the culture that he was born into and lived into, which was Judean culture, which was you don't give the Canaanites the time of day, and let alone a woman, you don't speak to them, you don't acknowledge their presence, you don't do anything. And in fact, their encounter is very rough. She comes up and, and calls, out, calls him out publicly, have mercy on me, son of David, heal my daughter. And Jesus' response is very derogatory. He says, well, I don't For one, I don't talk to people like you. And it's not fair to give the gifts that I have been given, we don't throw them to the dogs. In other words, he equates her with the lowest form of life within Cana or Judea at that time. Dogs were not pets for the most part. They just lived out in the wilds of the community and took their scraps where they could find it. And she falls back and says, yes, that's true. Us dogs have to survive but we do survive on the scraps off the master's table. At that point, Jesus knows he's bested. Her comebacks have, have, have stopped him every way along the way, and she grants her what she wants, and her daughter is healed. I find it interesting that, that this Eve is, is in Scripture because, you know, when you write a hero saga, which, which really are the four Gospels, the way they're written, they're hero sagas, kind of in the Greek form, you know, that the, the hero is born into the world, is transformative into nature, what the hero does is completely changes the life of, of people around them, and then it goes from glory to glory to glory. And even in the Christian movement, the cross seems to be the great, the great stumbling block, but even glory after that. And here it is, this story that, is, that is, is put in different places, Syrophoenician woman, Canaanite woman. The interpretation of each of the gospel writers takes the story and does something a little bit different with it, but it's still the same conflict, it's still the same end, it's still the same story. And, and why do they include it? Why do they include this story? Partly because the Gospels were written for outsiders. It, was, it wasn't necessarily the Gospels written f- completely for Judeans who knew Jewish history and knew what it was like to live within the Judean context. It was written for people who were on the outside in a lot of ways, people in other parts of the of the Roman Empire, who weren't Judean in background, but, but had caught on to the Jesus message and were transformed by it. And this story kind of speaks to the inclusion of them within the great tent of the Jesus movement. It also speaks to us even today, I think, even though with it, for most of us we don't live in a Jewish context at all, we live in a secular quasi-Christian context. 
But I think it speaks mostly to people who are oppressed, people who's, who you would think would be able to get something, but have had it taken away. Recently, I, I uh, went through a training that we have to do as, as clergy. Every five years, we have to take different trainings. We have to, we have to take boundary training, which teaches us to, to be wise and to play nice with other members of the congregation. You're probably glad that we do that. The other one we take is we take anti-racism training. And um, this is my third or fourth time doing it. And I'm always surprised when I do it that I find that it's not like I get new information, things I haven't heard before, but sometimes the context twisted things just a little bit and I come up, and I come up with a new understanding what it's like to be a person of color in the world and what it's like to have, your, have things that should be given to you withheld. And, and it's not just people of color, it has to do with gender, it has to do with one's sexual orientation, it has to, you know, there's a whole list of things in which people are held back because of either lifestyle or belief or the color of their skin or just their gender in itself. Denies them what others get. And they, and they are like this, this Canaanite woman who are asking for things that are really rightfully theirs. Why should she be differentiated from any, this Canaanite woman, why should she be differentiated from any Judean woman who would ask the same thing? And the stories within the gospel say that these people came and asked and they were received things. Why should she be denied? What is it about the insider and the outsider as far as the realm of God and the way that we respond to it? We see it around us now. I mean, several denominations within the United States are falling apart, basically, because the way that people interpret Scripture and, the, and who's in and who's out. Uh, even conservative congregations are splitting be over it by just having women in leadership. It splits the congregation, splits in, out of them, out of the non denomination. The Methodists and the Presbyterians are struggling mightily because of gender issues and sexuality issues. Some of them are electing to form their own groups because they're more conservative, while some are still saying that we need to move farther, farther forward and open up the church to even greater people. Even us as a congregation have struggled over the years on who's in and who's out. And I th in the long, long history of this congregation, there have been many struggles about who belongs and who doesn't. I remember, I remember one old, long-time member talked to me about the way that, that people saw people of other races here. At one time, it was really good to do benevolent work to help the Japanese, to help, to help the migrants, the, the Mexicans who come to pick fruit. But we never really thought of them as being inside of our congregation. And then when, when African Americans moved out in this area in the early 60s, there was, there was some real um, conversation with it within this congregation that was, do we really let them in? And even though they come from a disciple background, would they be happy here? And, and in some congregations, they would say, you wouldn't be happy here and they moved them along. Our sister congregation in, um, in Ontario, First Christian Church, in the 1920s was known as the Klan Church, the church where people who belonged to the Ku Klux Klan in the Ontario area belonged. And so, you know, that wasn't probably a really helpful environment for people of color or, or people who held different points of view within that city. They overcame that. They're still around today. They are no longer the Klan Church. But it's still something we have to struggle with in our own denomination and within our own life together is who is accepted. And do we accept those people as they are or do we have to make them conform to an idea of what religion is for us for them to find the grace of Christ and the love of God within the congregation? Some people have walked away from the church because that has been a very difficult thing for them and they're tired of fighting for what is theirs. To be a congregation that is open and affirming, as we proclaim to be each Sunday, to be a congregation that welcomes people as they are when they come through the door that we don't do, well, you, you check off these three things, you're good there, but you know you gotta work on four and five. If we take them as they really are and accept the gifts that God has given to us through them, 
we have to really stand with a Canaanite woman here and say that these people have to struggle for really what they need. They still are asking for things of God and people are holding it back to them. And how can we be like the best of Jesus in a certain sense and say, no, what you ask for is, is good and the healing that you desire is yours. If we are going to be a healing congregation moving forward into the future, we have to be willing to be bested by the people who are still asking for healing, who are still looking to be accepted, who are still wanting to say that they belong to the community and that God loves them as they are. And so, we as this congregation will continue to struggle with that. We can say we're open and affirming, we can say we're accepting, but each time that we are encountered by somebody new, somebody different, somebody who's looking, somebody's looking for that grace, looking to be healed, looking to be transformed and be a transforming interest for us, will challenge us to stay open just as Jesus was challenged to be open by this Canaanite woman. Amen. Will you pray with me? We are continually challenged, God, by people who are looking to be accepted and are looking to have their place at your table. May we be willing to accept that challenge, to be bested at times and reminded that God's love is for all. And as Christ at this time showed that he too could change his mind and overcome the prejudices of his own life, may we too be challenged by our own prejudices and overcome by your love. Amen.